okay assalamu alaikum now we are back with uh, the rest of the story of the ancient the rhyme of the ancient mariner uh, we started in the previous video talking about the story of the ancient mariner and we said that uh, he was uh, drifted with uh, his crew or with the men on his ship uh, far away uh, they were happy in the sea and uh, the nature was supporting them uh, until uh, an albatross came to the ship and at the beginning they were happy to see the albatross uh, uh, but uh, after that for no reason we don't know why but the ancient mariner killed the albatross after that their life start uh, changed dramatically and they got lost in the sea uh, they were trapped by the ice and then the men uh, the men who uh, actually congratulated him at the beginning for hunting and killing the albatross now they felt angry because there was they understood that there was a curse that was caused by that horrible crime um, now what happened is that all the men they suffered and died in front of him but the ancient mariner uh, was alive he couldn't die though he wanted to die he couldn't die because he suffered a lot being alone he hated the natural uh, the nature around him he couldn't look at the sea he couldn't look at the sky because the sun was very hot and during the daytime and it caused him much pain uh, he wanted just to close his eyes and not to see anything but actually uh, he felt that the view of the sky, the sea, and the dead bodies were, were like loads on his eyes. Uh, so um, he was looking at the uh, dead bodies and the men who died on the ship. And they were. he felt that they were staring at him, accusing him. And he thought that their look, actually, the curse inside their look was much more horrible than an orphan's case, a case, um, curse. Okay, now uh, during the daytime he suffered a lot, but during the night it was uh, more a little more, more peaceful for him. And once he looked at the sea and so he saw uh, creatures, the sea creatures, which are called uh, sea snakes, uh, he suddenly discovered that they were very beautiful creatures unlike what he thought at the beginning that this is a rotten sea and the creatures are horrible and nothing is beautiful so he looked at their beauty their colors uh, the light the the uh, that was reflected the moonlight that was reflected on them on the uh, the moving water because of their moving and then suddenly he felt inside heart that he loved them and he blessed them at this point when he felt the love for the natural things the curse was broken and he managed to get back to his country now this is the last stanza the self same moment I could pray. Then if you remember, he tried to pray in order to ask his God to uh, guide him back to his country. But every time he wanted to pray, he would feel that there is a wicked whisper in his ears, turning his heart into dry dust. Uh, dust. But now, after the curse was broken, he managed to pray he could pray and from my neck so free the albatross fell off and sank like lead into the sea so all the time he felt now we don't know this is an imagination so as if the albatross that he killed was on his neck and now after the curse was broken and he managed to pray the albatross the dead albatross fell and sank like lead into the sea so like uh, very heavy load okay so as if he now got rid of the burden of his sin يعني تخلص من uh, من what من حمل الخطيئة اللي كان هو حملها so in this last extract of the poem the rhyme of the ancient mariner the poet through the mariner says that every moment he could pray and did uh, pray to God instantly. So the, the idea is that from that moment, he uh, actually started to pray 
Once he could pray, he continued to pray to God. Instantly, the dead albatross fell off his neck of itself and likely sank into the sea. طبعا the sea is usually a sign or a symbol of purgation التطهير يعني الإنسان يعني وكأنه ماء البحر يعني طريقة للتطهر والنظافة فهو كانت الطريقة للتخلص من ذنبه إنه هذا الذنب وقع في الماء Okay, now let's come to the literary devices, the imagery. I mentioned that several times in which he tried to draw for us a descriptive uh, image of what he was seeing. And uh, in those uh, descriptions, he actually refers to the sensations of taste, smell, touch, and hearing as well. So most of the time there was the visual, actually. He uh, looked at the visual sensations, especially when he described the sea snakes. So you can see, go back to the uh, poem and uh, read those lines about the snakes and the description, their colors, the light, everything is referring to the visual sensations. Now alliteration, I mentioned that the alliteration is the repetition of the same letter in the same line. So if you remember seven days, seven nights, I saw that curse. So you have the sa sound is repeated here, which gives music to the uh, poem. Okay, now the metaphor, if you remember, we talked about the metaphor, it refers to mean a meaning or identity ascribed to one subject by way of another. Uh, in a metaphor, not for, in, in a metaphor, one subject is implied to be another so as to draw a comparison between their similarities and shared traits. So they coiled and swam, and every track was a flash of golden fire. So actually they coiled here, um, I think uh, uh, in the book it was mistaken. They refers to the snake actually, to the sea snake, not the mariners, okay? The sea snakes or the creatures, they coiled, they were happy and swam. And every track was a flash of golden fire. So the track, their track is, uh, their, this is a metaphor, the track was described as fire. It was described as a golden fire. Look at another metaphor that we talked about. A spring of love gushed from my heart is the metaphor used for love. It shows how beautiful the bride and the groom looked that the ancient mariner blessed them with a spring of love. Okay, let me uh, just go back to this uh, part uh, because it's in uh, video number one. So let's correct it. Uh, we talked about uh, the snakes uh, that were within the shadow of the ship. I watched their rich attire. Taban there here refers to the snakes. Okay, they coiled and swam. Here he talked about the snakes, the snakes, not like in the first uh, uh, in the previous video in which I said it's referring to the uh, mariners. No, it's referring to the snakes who coiled and swam. He watched that their skin were marked and this is the description of their actually skin. Okay, so let me go back now to the last, uh, to the uh, metaphor. So here we said that with a spring of love gushed from my heart is the metaphor used for love. It shows how beautiful the sea snakes looked that the ancient mariner blessed them with a spring of love gushing from his heart. إذن هو تخيل أو تصور إنه الحب اللي في داخل قلبه كان وكأنه ينبوع ماء تدفق. من قلبه إذا من شدة الحب اللي كان عنده so this is uh, this symbolizes the great amount of love that he felt towards those snakes okay personification okay so personification if you remember we talked about this also when we said that he used uh, he referred to the moon as a she, so personification refers to the practice of attaching human traits and characteristics within animate objects, uh, phenomena, and animals, and that was the moon. 
okay hair beams hair beams be mocked the sultry mane so here the moon in these lines is personified as a mocking woman as a mocking woman simile اللي هو التشبيه وعادة we use usually use uh, such as I like it is the practice of drawing parallel parallels or comparisons between two unrelated and dissimilar things people beings places and concepts so the sky and the sea and the sea and the sky lay like بسبب وجود like we know that this is simile a load on my weary eye so a comparison comparison of the sky and the sea to a weight on the eye is an qarana ma bayna as-sama'i wal bahar bi awzan aw thiqal ala al-'aynayn okay now the symbol a symbol is literary uh, is a literary device that contains several layers of meaning that contains several layers of meanings okay often concealed at first sight and is representative of several other aspects or concepts and traits than those that are visible in the literal translation alone and for example when we use the sun as a symbol of happiness or the hot sun as a symbol of difficulty and hardship and so on for example in the rhyme of the ancient mariner the mariner is an actual symbolic representation of adam is an the ancient mariner who ibara an rams li لآدم لسيدنا آدم. The ancient mariner slaying of the albatross is equal to Adam and Eve eating the forbidden fruit from the tree of knowledge. I think you know the story of Adam and Eve. So as if the crime of the ancient mariner is comparable to the crime of Adam and Eve or the sin of Adam and Eve. Uh, Adam and Eve suffered because of their sin and they had to uh, pay back for what they did and the ancient mariner the same thing. Okay, now the moon and the sun, another symbol, uh, they play also play an important symbol in this story. The sun represents God's influence of wrathful power when God is angry. So the sun is a symbol of his uh, anger, uh, but the moon has a more positive association than the sun. So the moon is related to mercy, while the sun is related to uh, torture. Generally, troubling outcome happens to the mariner during the day, while more favorable, favorable result happens by moonlight. I think we explained this. For example, the mariner's cares lifts and he returns home by moonlight okay so this the sun is the symbol of torturing the moon is the symbol of mercy when they got the curse it was the daytime when they this curse was broken or lifted it was the uh, night time and the moonlight was there okay Okay, now let's uh, finish with, uh, we are done with uh, Coleridge. Now we will move to Percy uh, Shelley, uh, son of a wealthy landowner. Shelley was tempestuous, uh, revolutionary, who floated the conventional views of his society. So he was against the social views or the conventional views of his society. He was expelled from Oxford. Coleridge, by the way, uh, so Coleridge, uh, the previous one was Coleridge. Coleridge was, uh, went to Cambridge and left without finishing his study. And Shelley, he went to Oxford and he was expelled in Tarad in 1811 for publishing a pamphlet entitled The Necessity of Atheism. فتخيلوا شعراء رائعين ومش بالضرورة معهم شهادات جامعية. He married Harriet Westbrook uh, in the same year. However, the marriage was unhappy one, and in 1814, the couple separated. Shelley eloped, يعني هربا, escaped with Mary uh, Wollstonecraft, Wollstonecraft uh, Godwin, uh, daughter of William Godwin, uh, the radical philosopher, and of Mary Wollstonecraft. 
It's supposed to be a craft. No. Anyway, author of A Vindication of the Rights of Women. So you can notice that it seems that he was attracted by their revolutionary opinion, either the father or the mother, and definitely the daughter is similar to them. From the beginning, we said that he rebelled or he rejected the conventional views of his society. They were married shortly after Herod committed suicide in 1816. So his first wife committed suicide. After that, he got married to his uh, mistress. During that year, Shelley met and befriended Byron. Uh, we were supposed to look at an example from Byron, but I thought uh, the ones that we looked, the romantic uh, poets that we looked about, looked at, sorry, uh, were enough, about five uh, poets until now. So they traveled together in Europe, and then in 1818, the Shillies settled in Italy. In Pisa, uh, Shelley wrote most of his best lyrics, Ode to the West Wind, to a Skylark, his elegy, Adonia, Adonias, on the death of John uh, Keats, and his essay, uh, The Defense of Poetry. So all these were the works of Rome, uh, Shelley, okay, like Byron, Shelley was sympathetic to the Greek struggle for independence and wrote Hellas in 1822. So definitely, we said that the Romantic people or poets were are supporting the the suppressed people, the marginalized people, uh, the people who suffered from the political suppression uh, or uh, oppression or from the religious oppression. He was drowned in a storm, so he sank in a storm while he was sailing off the Italian coast in 1822. So his life was full of troubles. Shelley's poetry swings between adolescent immaturity, characterized by self-pity and exaggerated artificiality, and elevated lyrical beauty, mature mysticism, and a calm philosophy of life, which affirms the immortality of the human spirit. The eloquence and music of his poems were, are rarely seen in poets of his time. So his, uh, his poems were like of elite style, and, uh, but they were full of self-pity. And this is natural, actually, because of the difficulties that he went through. He was expelled from university. His first wife uh, committed suicide. He had to, before that, to elope with his mistress and until he managed to get married to her. And then uh, he uh, left England and lived in Italy. So definitely he had this kind of uh, feelings because of the uh, difficulties that he went through. Okay, but anyway... We will come to what is important for us is his uh, poem, uh, a sonnet, which is a sonnet, Ozymandias. Uh, you will enjoy Ozymandias a lot because uh, this is uh, could be related to our actually religion in which we talk about the people who think they are powerful, they uh, have all the authority and they can do anything that they want, but when death comes, they are nothing. They just disappear and nobody remembers them. Okay, so that's the idea of Zamandias. The sonnet is uncharacteristic of Schiller's style in its conventional form and rigidity. إحنا حكينا في البداية إنه كانت immaturity, adolescent immaturity كانت يعني قصائده مش كتير بلتزم فيها بالقوانين وفي عنده exaggerated artificiality يعني and elevated lyrical beauty. But uh, with uh, Shell's style, uh, it was different from the conventional ones that he used to write. Okay, its power arises from Shell's ironic concentration of his imagery, which allows him to reach an intense realization of his subject. For someone whose methods were so chaotic, يعني كان فوضوي في أساليبه, okay, his imagination soaring and narcissistic, uh, uh, actually he showed more discipline 
in this poem. So uh, it was like surprising for the readers. How come he used to write like an adolescent and suddenly he is actually uh, following the conventions in his writing. So let's look at Ozymandias. So Ozymandias is Ramses II. He is an Egyptian uh, king, a pharaoh, if you remember. Okay, so you can see this is uh, the desert of Egypt. And you can see the photo that we will talk about. So I met a traveler from an antique land who said two vast and trunkless legs of stone stand in the desert. These are the legs. Okay, they are of stone and they stand in the desert. Near them on the sand, what can you see near them on the sand? Half sunk. A shattered visage lies in Wijihada, in the nose of the Ramel Madfun, and nose of Bayin, whose frown and wrinkled lip and the sneer of cold command. Okay, على وجهه ممكن تشوف إيش تجعيدة جبينه مجحد. Okay, وفي عندي ال الشفايف مشدودات وكان في عندنا نظرة من الأوامر الباردة يعني إنسان بارد وبس موجود لإعطاء الأوامر Till that it's a sculptor Will those passions read وطبعا هذا دليل على براعة النحات لأنه هذا النحات تمكن من أنه يعني يقرأ هذه المشاعر وي... وي... ويعكسها في النحت بتاعه لدرجة أنه رغم الدمار اللي حصل للتمثال إلى أنه المشاعر هذه واضحة الغضب وال... والقوة اللي في الملك رمسيس كانت So till that يعني هذه الملامح اللي كانت قوية وظاهرة في المنحوتة Till that it's a sculptor Will those passions read which yet survive stamped on these lifeless things ورغم انه هذه الاشياء تدمرت مع الوقت والزمن الا انه هذه المشاعر بسبب جوده النحت لا زالت مرسومه على وجه الملك او تمثال الملك the hand that mocked them اليد التي طبعا the hand this refers to the sculptor اللي هو النحات that mocked them التي قامت برسمهم and the heart that fed والقلب اللي أظهرهم and on the pedestal okay. إذا هو هنا بيتكلم عن ال... هذه المشاعر اللي أظهرها قلب الملك في ذلك الوقت واللي تمكن النحات بإيده من أنه ي... يعني يمثلها ويرسمها على وجه التمثال فكان هذا يعني روعة النحات and on the pedestal these words appear هاي في هنا كانت في مكتوب على جزئية منه ايش كان مكتوب نشوف my name is Zumandias king of kings انا Zumandias رمسيس الثاني ملك الملوك look on my works ye mighty and despair طبعا here he asks the people that at that time when he actually uh, made this uh, statue, he asked the people to look at his great achievements around in Egypt because he was of a great deeds actually and achievements and he fought and uh, bit the, the enemies. So he wanted everyone to know that he was the king of the kings, the person of great achievements. And when you look at my achievements, you have to be scared. You have to uh, feel despaired because you will not be able to do what I did. I am the king of the kings. Okay. So nothing. الآن الراوي بإيش بيتكلم. Nothing beside remains. Yeah, there were great achievements during the king's time, but now nothing remains. Everything disappeared. Round the decay. ما فيش حوالي إلا الدمار. Okay, decay. Of that colossal wreck. Boundless and bare. 
the lone and level sands stretch far away إذا لم يتبقى من مملكته ومن عرشه ومن إنجازاته العظيمة إلا بقايا التمثال ورمال الصحراء تمتد لمسافات بعيدة. So this is by Shelley in which he talks about the Ozymandias and losing his power. Let's come to the analysis. So what is the meaning of Ozymandias? The title of Ozymandias refers to an alternate name of the ancient Egyptian pharaohs, Ramses II. In Ozymandias, Shelley describes a crumbling statue of Ozymandias as a way to portray the transience of political power and to praise art's power of preserving the past. إذن Ozymandias, لما كتبوا Shelley, كان الفكرة إنه يورينا إنه كل قوة سياسية إلى ضياع ودمار في النهاية بينما العمل الفني أو الع... أيوة بالضبط العمل الفني يعيش ويحافظ على الماضي يعني ما يمثله العمل الفني هو حياة لآخر العمر ما تمثله القوة السياسية هي ض... ضياع وانحلال What is the story behind Ozymandias? Schiller's poem imagines a meeting between the narrator and a traveler who describes a ruined statue. He or she, the traveler, saw in the middle of the desert somewhere. And the description of the statue is a meditation on the fragility of a human power. So this is very important. The fragility, hashashit, quwwat al-insan. Human power and on the effects of time. وقوة الزمن. إذا الإنسان مهما كان قوي مع الزمن رايح تضيع قوته وينتهي هذا الإنسان وينتهي أثره. What form does Ozymandias take? Ozymandias is a sonnet. In this case, a variant of a Petrarchan sonnet. يعني not Shakespearean. The Petrarchan sonnet is divided into an eight-lined octave that creates a situation and a six-line cystic that comments on the situation. What is the irony of Ismandias? Of course, it's clear. You think that you are the king of the kings from that statement, but actually what is left from you is just a broken statue. This is the irony. Okay, so the irony in the poem lies in the fact that the mighty ruler had the following words engraved on his statue. My name is Ismandias, king of kings. Look upon my works, ya mighty and despair. يعني لو أنتوا كنتوا في الصحراء صحراء مصر وقرأتوا هاي العبارة وطلعتوا وين هو الملك الملوك؟ أين هو ملك الملوك؟ أين هي الأعمال العظيمة لملك الملوك؟ كل شيء اختفى وانتهى ف you will just smile you will think this is ironic امر ساخر انت بتحكي انك ملك الملوك وانجازاتك عظيمه ورائعه وتطلعوا عليها بتطلع بتلاقيش الا الصحراء والرمل ما فيش اي حاجه وفقط تمثال محطم so this is the irony these words conveyed he was so powerful that no other king could surpass him yet the arrogant King, المغرور, الملك المغرور, didn't realize that after his death, the very same statue would lie shattered, and all that would be left of it would be the inscription. فقط الجملة المنقوشة اللي ضايلة إلنا. The arrogant words and the sneer on its visage are in direct contrast with the statue's present fate. إذن العبارة المنحوتة على قاعدة التمثال، أوكي؟ طبعاً الكلمات المغرورة المليئة بالتكبر والغرور والنظرة القوية اللي كانت مرسومة على وجهه، أوكي؟ والتعابير القوية اللي على وجهه كانت في تناقض كامل مع وضع التمثال. فهو ما كان عارف هذا الملك إنه في يوم من الأيام ما رح يضل منه إلا تمثال محطم. The king may have been powerful during his reign. طبعا reign the pronunciation is similar to rain that comes down from the sky. But after his death, his legacy 
is at the mercy of the ravaging forces of nature. His past glory is now reduced to two standing legs and a shattered visage. يعني كل الجلوري بتابعه كل العظمة تبعته تلخصت فقط في رجلتين من الصخور ووجه محطم جنبهم. This brings out the irony of the poem. وهذا هي نقطة السخرية اللي القصيدة بتحاول تظهرها لنا. إنه في وقته كان ملك ملوك كان إله الحكم كان إله الأمر والنهي وكان يخافوا منه الناس من قوة إنجازاته وعظمتها ولكن لما إحنا نتطلع على التمثال بتاعه نجد sorry for that I sneezed God bless me okay thank you this brings out the irony of the poem I said that no need to repeat what does the statue of Zamandias symbolize okay in Schiller's work, the statue of the ancient Egyptian pharaohs, uh, pharaoh Ramses II or Ozymandias symbolizes political tyranny. Then, بشير أو بمثل Ozymandias هذا بمثل الطاغية السياسية. Okay. كل طاغية سياسية شيل بيحكي له أنت اليوم تطغو على شعبك تطغو على العالم وتتكبر ولكن ستكون نهايتك مثل Ozymandias. Through the story of Ozymandias, Shelley wants to show that man's achievements have as short a life as he himself enjoys. يعني فعليا كل إنجازاتك يا الإنسان هي فقط مرتبطة بفترة حياتك. خلصت حياتك ما حدا رايح يفتكرك. You will die and your achievements will be, will actually either be destroyed or will be just forgotten by people. The image of the two huge legs with a broken face lying under it provides a perfect picture of ruin and decay. إذا منظر التمثال الرجلتين المكسرات والتمثال الوجه اللي مرمي على الأرض هي بقايا التمثال هي رمزي رمز للدمار والتحلل. How does Ozymandias relate to romanticism in Ozymandias? Percy Shelley applies an element of romanticism to suggest that at works preserve the artworks, sorry, preserve the inner self of human beings. The poet develops the sculpture of Zimandias as a physical representation of an inner self. So the uh, the poet here talks about okay. The poet develops the sculpture of Zimandias. Okay, fine. So the sculptor from the beginning, when he uh, made Zimandias uh, statue, actually he used his art to reflect what was inside the heart of Zimandias. Do you remember when we talked about the frown, the eyes? The strong eyes, the cold eyes, okay? And uh, so we said that the heart of the king reflected those emotions on his face, those arrogant emotions on his face. But who was the skillful one? It was the sculptor who managed to capture these feelings and show them on the face. So this is actually the role of the poet to bring the inner self to the light in order or to the surface in order to understand the human beings. So this is the soul of romanticism. What does the hand that mocked them mean? The hand that mocked them. Okay, in the literal sense, the statue of Ozymandias is crafted by sculptor described here as being attentive to detail. إذا النحات اللي نحت هذا التمثال كان attentive to detail. يعني منتبه للتفاصيل. The hand that mocked them is said to be passionate and motivated by the line. يبدو إنه اليد التي نحتت هذه المشاعر كانت أيدي يعني محبة للعمل و و ولديها الدافعية by the line heart that fed okay and motivated by the line heart that fed but ultimately the fate of the statue is at the will of the sculptor okay إذا الأيدي اللي نحتت 
هذه الملامح الملامح طبعا هذه غذتها قلب الملك ولكن النحات كان نحات يعني متمكن وباشنت يعني محب جدا لعمله لدرجة أنه كان منتبه للتفاصيل وأظهر تفاصيل هذه المشاعر اللي طفت على الوجه أوكي يعني لو إن فهنا لما بيحكي the fate of the statue is at the will of the sculptor يعني لو السكلبتر ما كانش نحات ماهر أو ما كانش بده يظهر هذه المشاعر كان ممكن ما يظهرهاش وبرضه ما حدش ينتبه فكانت آه طريقة النحت أو شكل المنحوت آه بين يدي النحات the expression on the face in fact showed that the sculptor had successfully read the passions in the heart of the person whose statue he had made. إذا كان في عنا نحات ممتاز ناجح رائع في عمله لدرجة إنه قرأ المشاعر لداخل قلب الملك وأظهرها على وجهه. These passions still appeared on the statue's face. وهذه المشاعر لا زالت ظاهرة على وجه المنحوتة. The art that transferred them to stone still survives, though the king himself no longer exists. So here, it's a call for poets, for uh, artists, to take their role, their role, the, because their works will survive. But the tyranny, the kings, and those who uh, illiterated people will die and will no longer exist. Okay. So with John Keats, I think we need a third part, but it hopefully it will be a short part. Okay, I will stop now because I feel so tired. Okay, and later, inshallah, I will do the last part. Thank you very much and see you with John Keats, inshallah.